Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our study of the Gospel of Mark. We will be continuing in chapter 8 today, so let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your word, how you want to speak to us through your word, how you want us to know you through your word, how you want to work with your word in our lives to align us with who you are, with your purposes, with your kingdom. Lord, let your word do a work in our lives today, transforming us into the image of Jesus. Amen. Let's see, we're looking at Mark 8, picking up at verse 27 today. Let me throw it up there on the screen for you. But here is our text. Jesus, Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Starting in verse 27, we read, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Okay, so Jesus, most of his ministry so far is in Galilee, down around the Sea of Galilee. He's, we've seen Mark showing him doing multiple crossings of the lake back and forth, village to village. Other times, the disciples, they're walking around, going around Galilee, but still mostly centered around the Sea of Galilee. Now, going up to Caesarea Philippi, they're going up, they're going north, from the Sea of Galilee, sort of north, northwest, up toward Mount Hermon. And here they are up there, and Jesus asked them a question. So my first question about this text is, why were Jesus and his disciples going to the villages around Caesarea Philippi? Was this a lo location significant for the question he asked in this story? Okay, good question here. I'm I think Jesus is probably going up there because maybe he hadn't been there before. Maybe he's trying to take the gospel up here, taking the good news of the kingdom of God up to these people that haven't heard. And maybe it's a place to go where he hasn't been heard of as much, a place where his ministry will be fresh, a place where he can uh, connect without the crowds barging in on him, or pushing in on him. So that could be it. Could be also a place. I mean, we have Caesarea here, named after Caesar, uh, a place where Caesar is maybe, maybe, uh, maybe popular. Maybe his control is more evident there. And here's Jesus, the King, the Messiah, come to challenge this other claimant to the role of King. Question two: What access did the disciples have? to what the people were saying about Jesus, that Jesus himself did not have. So the first question you remember is Jesus asked not, who do you say I am, but who do people say I am? Uh, what was it the case that the disciples, maybe while Jesus was preaching, while Jesus was teaching, while Jesus was healing people, working miracles, that the disciples were what we call working the crowd, listening to people, seeing what they had to say. And so that maybe the disciples heard people speculate about who Jesus was, speculations that Jesus himself might not have heard, and that Jesus was wondering, hey, what, what, what are these people saying? And you might also wonder here, okay, Jesus, we Christians confess, is God in the flesh. God, we say, is omniscient. God knows everything. So would we also need the claim that Jesus, while he's walking around here, knows everything? Jesus is omniscient. So that when Jesus asks the question, who do people say I am? He already knows the answer to that. Uh, that's a good question. Well, that sort of gets us into the next couple of questions I have here. Question three, was Jesus primarily looking for information or to start a conversation? If we take Jesus in his ministry here, Jesus walking around, acting human, looking human, yet doing supernatural things as he connects with God's power. If Jesus at this time is omniscient, 
then he's not looking for information. Doesn't need information. Already has all the information we could possibly conceive. On that case, we might say Jesus is out to start a conversation. He's working toward the question, who do you say I am? With this initial question of who do people say I am? But as we look at scripture, I don't see a need to say that Jesus is functioning with omniscience here. Uh, we see in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus is described as emptying himself. That the Son of God, when he took on flesh, emptied himself. Now, wh what does it mean, emptied himself? Well, theologians and Bible scholars have been arguing about that for as long as we've been reading Philippians chapter 2. What does he empty himself of? Now, we can see at least some of the time in Scripture that Jesus has emptied himself of omniscience. When we turn, say, to Mark 13, or the parallel passages in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, when it comes time to Jesus talking about his return, about him actually bringing the kingdom in fully and obliterating, overcoming all the other kingdoms in their totality, Jesus says there then, I don't know. Father knows, the son doesn't know. So if we take those passages, Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, as paradigm examples, there are at least some things Jesus doesn't know. Oh, I think it's quite possible here that Jesus might be not knowing this, that Jesus is genuinely seeking knowledge, genuinely seeking knowledge and information from his disciples. They can provide it. But I also think that he's trying to start a conversation here. And it's genuine. Who do the crowd say I am? And then he's going to get to the question of this man. Who do you say I am? How are you different from the crowds? How are you different from the masses? How are you as insiders? How are you as my students, as my apprentices, different in understanding me from the crowds? Now, we're going to see throughout the gospel that there's sometimes not a lot of distinction between what the disciples believe about Jesus, who they say about him, who they say he is, and what the crowd's saying. Uh, question four. In what ways has this question come up previously? Surely the disciples have been asking the question themselves. Sure they had. They've been asking the question, who is this man? When they were out in the boat in the middle of a storm and have to wake him up and Jesus calms the storm. That's the question, who is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. When he goes around healing people, heals the blind, gives sight to them, casts out demons, exhibits power over nature. The question is natural. Who is this man? Who, who do we say he is? So this conversation seems to be a natural conversation for the crowds to engage in constantly, for the disciples themselves to engage in constantly. Now, we don't see Jesus broaching this question explicitly with them prior to this, but I'm sure they've been asking the question. Question five, what are some of the ways we confront this question today? What are the consequences that come from asking and answering them? Yeah, we have to answer these questions. We who claim to be Christians, we who claim to be in the vicinity of Jesus. It might be that you who are watching, listening today, you're not yet ready to make a commitment to Jesus. You're not yet a follower. You're not yet an apprentice. You're not yet one who identifies him as Christ, as Messiah, as Lord, as Savior, as any of those terms that we Christians might bandy about. But the question's occurring to you, who is this Jesus? What is he? You, you might be with some people. Oh, he's a figment of the Christian's imagination. He's just a myth, or he's an ideal person. He's a projection of our values and our ideals. Others of you might say he's the son of God. But, but even with claims like that, have to answer the question, what do you mean by son of God? Which God? Son in what way? Son in a way that, well, everybody's a child of God. So yeah, he's a child of God. We're all children of God. Those are good questions. But then there's consequences that come from that. 
if we say Jesus is a great teacher, that's one thing. If we say Jesus was a great teacher, that's another thing. If we just say he was a great teacher, we can maybe safely file away in the historical file cabinet. Yeah, he's a great teacher back in those days, attracted a lot of people. And sure, there's probably a few things that, that he said that we should remember today, like love your neighbor, uh, be kind, be nice, uh, all those kinds of things. We like those kinds of things, but if we think really deeply, maybe that's not the signs of a great teacher because today we take those as platitudes. Everybody's supposed to believe that. Nothing confrontational there, nothing deep. Sure, we don't live up to it. Sure, we need to hear it. But yeah, everybody would say it. But if we say Jesus is Messiah, if we say Jesus is Lord, there's some consequences to that. We, we maybe can't just get away with saying, well, yeah, he's Lord. That's a religious term. But is he Lord of my life, of our lives, of, of our world in such a way that we have to give him authority, that we have to own his lordship, to recognize him as the authority for us? That might get a little more dicey, a little more challenging. Uh, question six. How quick were the disciples' answers? Did they have to stop and think about it? Did they have to stop and reflect and say, well, what have y'all heard? Peter, what have you heard? James, how about you? What if you go to different places than we do? Uh, Philip, how about you? Bartholomew, Thomas, what do, what do y'all think? Well, maybe I think maybe these had disciples had answers ready on their tongues. Oh, some say you're John the Baptist. Well, obviously, if John the Baptist and Jesus are two different people, which we've seen plainly in the gospel, that's a silly thing to say. But maybe in saying they're, that he's John the Baptist, they're saying he's like John the Baptist, or he's continuing the ministry of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was preaching a baptism of repentance. Repent, get right with God, turn from your evil ways. Yeah, you're a John the Baptist. Others would say you're an Elijah. You're challenging the authorities. You're challenging the Herods and the Pilots and the Caesars of our day. Just like Elijah challenged the Ahabs, the Jezebels of his day. Or we could say, hey, yeah, Jesus, you're one of the prophets. You're like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Hosea or Amos or Joel. You're calling the people back to God. That's what the people are saying about you. So the disciples, I think, wouldn't have too much trouble coming up with that. Question seven, why were the people thinking of Jesus in terms of other individuals? What evidence did they have to go by? So why, why did they say, some say you're John the Baptist? Why, why did they look at a particular person? Uh, understand that one of the prophets, you're a prophet, Jesus, or you're a rabbi, Jesus, or you're a messiah, Jesus. We understand that because those are categories of thought. But why do they name people John the Baptist, Elijah? Why that? And and what evidence would they have to go on? What do they know of John the Baptist? What do they know about Elijah? And what do they know about Jesus that causes them, that would lead them to make those associations? Okay. Well, there's another question here. Question eight. What are some of the answers people give today about who Jesus is? And again, we might ask, what evidence do they have to go by? Now, when people in those days were giving their answers to the question, who is Jesus? What is Jesus? They have things to look at. They could look at his teaching, what it is he has to say, how he says it, how he preaches the kingdom of God, proclaims the kingdom of God, claims that it's here now. Now he does it with authority. They could also look at the things he does. They could look at his healings, his deliverances, his power over nature. Although that would be evidence that the people there and then who are seeing it with their own eyes, hearing it with their own ears, that they could use to come to a conclusion about who Jesus is. And what about people today? What evidence do we have to go on? Well, ours is a little second, and we, we go by testimony. We go by the testimony of Scripture. The Scripture that Matthew, Mark, 
in our case, Luke and John, had to report about who Jesus was and what he did. But look at that. Uh, some people, their direct evidence about Jesus is not the Bible because they don't read the Bible. But it might be what they hear from Christians. If they go to church, it might be what they hear from a preacher or Sunday school teacher. Might never crack the Bible themselves, but they hear it from those. Or it might just be from Christians in general. Maybe they took a class on world religions in college or in high school. And they learned that way. Or maybe they're just in our culture and they absorb a little bit. Yeah, Jesus was this guy. He was a guru, a swami, a great teacher, a religion guy long ago. Yeah, sort of irrelevant to us today because he, man, he didn't even have electricity. He didn't even have indoor plumbing. So how could he speak into our world? Uh, also wondering this evidence question, how we Christians live today. I mean, we talk about Jesus. We, as they say, witness for Jesus to people around us. We share Jesus with people. What kind of evidence do people see in our lives, in our words, the way we comport ourselves? about who Jesus is. When people look at the way they, that we who claim Jesus is Lord, they look at us. What kind of evidence are we giving them that Jesus is who he says he is, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Messiah, that Jesus is Savior? Can we give them better evidence, clearer evidence? Question nine. How long does it take for Peter to give his answer? To what degree did the other disciples agree with him? So Jesus is asked the question, who do the people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. Okay, Jesus says, what about you? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. How long did that answer take? What Was there a period of silence while well, the disciples are thinking? while they're talking amongst themselves? Were they coming to a committee conclusion? Or did Peter immediately say, you are the Messiah? I mean, after all, Jesus, that's why we're following you. That's why we dropped everything. That's why we dropped the fishing business. That's how we supported our families. That's, that's why we're spending all our time with you, going around with you. We believe you are the Messiah. Okay, Peter says this. Uh, each of the Gospels, it's Peter that says this. What about the other disciples? Were the other disciples on the same page with Peter? Peter? They said, yeah, right, Peter. They said, hey, man, Peter, you got it right, Peter. Or were some of them thinking, huh, maybe, yeah, we, we sort of think Jesus might be the Messiah, but, but some of us are with the crowd. Some of us think he might be a prophet. Some of us might think he's a continuation of John the Baptist. Some of us might think, oh, yeah, he's Elijah, and maybe one of us will be Elisha to him. Let's see. Question 10. What did Peter mean by Messiah? Is his answer here in Mark substantially different from what we see his answer is given in Matthew, where Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God? Now, when we read what Peter says there in Matthew, and here in Mark, all he says is, you are the Messiah. And Matthew quotes Peter saying, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Our Messiah and Son of the Living God, vastly different claims. Well, we Christians today are prone to think that Messiah is one thing and Son of the Living God is another thing. Now, we confess both to be true of Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the King the one who is ruling over this kingdom of God that is, that is being brought in now. But when we hear of son of the living God or just son of God, we tend to hear that as a metaphysical claim, that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, that he's divine, that he's God incarnate. So when we say Jesus is Messiah, you are the Messiah, Peter says, the son of the living God, we think a lot of times that, Jesus, that Peter's making that dual claim. Yes, you are the Messiah, you are the king, but also, hey, you're the second person in the Trinity. 
if we read the Old Testament, Old Testament uses the Son of God language from time to time, not nearly as much as New Testament, but sometimes. The Son of God language is usually tied to kinship language. We say, go to Psalm 2. Psalm 2, today, you're my son. Today, I've chosen you. And we have that there. And it's king language. So it could be that in Matthew, when Peter is saying, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, he's using that parallelism, that synonymous parallelism that is common to Hebrew thought, saying, you are the Messiah, you are the king, you are the king, the son of the living God, you're the one he's chosen, that he's putting on the throne. So that in saying that, Peter is not making the claim that he's the second person of the Trinity. I don't, personally, I, I don't think Peter at that time understood the fullness of who Jesus was. I don't think he understood yet that Jesus was God in the flesh. I don't think he understood yet that using the later language, the later language of the church, that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. So the way I would read Matthew's take on Peter's claim is that he's saying the same thing two different ways. You're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. You are the king that God is bringing into the world. Now, as we read Jesus in his fullness, I don't think we Christians can escape the claim that he's God in the flesh. I don't think we can escape the claim that he's the second person of the Trinity. But I don't think that's what Peter's saying right here. Question 11. Uh, do you think Peter understood what he was saying? To what degree do we understand the claims we make in our confessions of faith? So just taking Peter to be saying, you are the Messiah, you are the king. Does Peter understand that? Well, we'll get more on that just uh, in our next story here that we're going to go on to about Peter's response to Jesus and what Jesus has to say next that riles Peter up so much. So I'm not really sure Peter fully understood what he was saying when he said, you are the Messiah. But what about us? When we say Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus is the Savior, Jesus is the Lord, do we fully understand those claims? I'd say probably not, but we're growing into it. So for me, I think it's helpful if we as Christians come to Jesus, not imagining that we fully understand him, but seeking to learn from him. That, that we as Peter and James and John and all the others would attach ourselves to Jesus as his disciples, as his apprentices, as his students, saying, Jesus, we have some idea of who you are and what you're about, but we admit we don't understand it fully. Teach us Help us learn more. We want to be fully knowledgeable about who you are so that we can be your people. So I think it's okay that we don't understand it all. Question 12. Uh, Mark is very terse, giving us no details on the rest of the conversation. All he gives us is Jesus' warning not to tell anyone about it. Why so little? I mean, because there's a very short conversation here on the way Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? they replied. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say one of the prophets. Okay, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Oh, Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Okay, that's that's very short. Maybe if I'm one of the disciples here, I'd be saying, okay, Jesus, that's pretty great, but, but Messiah, that's huge. Why can't we tell anybody? That's something they need to know. Their life depends on it. That's really good news. But we don't see that conversation. Why so little? And remember, these authors of the Gospels, they're giving us revelation, giving us truth from God, telling us the story of Jesus, but, but they're each highly selected. No single one and none of them even all together tells us everything that could be told. And we see that explicitly in the Gospel of John, where John says, were, we to, were I to give you all the stories of Jesus, I mean, all the books in the world wouldn't contain them all. Huge books that would report everything. But Mark's giving us the core of the story here. Question 13 follows up right on this. 
Why does Jesus warn them not to tell anyone? How did the disciples receive this warning? I think, again, that this matches up with Jesus's asking other people earlier, don't tell anyone. I mean, just earlier in this chapter, Jesus has healed a man, a blind man, and said, hey, don't go back into the village. Don't, don't immediately tell people what's going on here. And I think it's because people misunderstand it. Sure, the disciples have here confessed, you are the Messiah. It's using the right word. But Jesus is sure they don't understand it. They don't know what to do with that. claim. We'll see that in the next story. So let's go ahead and turn to that next story. Verse 31, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Okay, my first question here is, how quick was the transition from Peter's confession, you are the Messiah, and Jesus' warning not to tell anyone, to his beginning to teach them about his coming suffering? So, I mean, in, in my Bible, we have this nice editorial heading, Jesus predicts his death, as, as if there's a gap between these stories, between Jesus talking about his identity, who the people say he is and who the disciples say he is, and then this starting to talk about his coming suffering, his rejection, his death, and his resurrection. Uh, I mean, I think Mark's warning us to hold these very closely to not let them hang apart as if they're totally different things. Because I think Jesus makes the immediate, nearly immediate transition here from, yes, Peter, you're right, I am the Messiah. Don't tell anybody about that. But then he immediately transitions to talking about the Son of Man suffering many things, must be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law. He must be killed even. And after three days, rise again. And how did the disciple? How did he expect the disciples to handle this shift? I don't think he did. I ex think he expected the disciples to have a hard time because Messiah. You don't ex you don't associate messiahship, being the king, with being rejected. But this rejection, this suffering, all sounds like failure. I mean, Jesus is on the rise. He's on the increase. He's coming on, guys. Everything's upward looking. And then Jesus pivots immediately to suffering, to death, to loss. Question two follows right on this. Did Jesus expect the disciples to understand his claims on first hearing? In other words, when Jesus says the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Did he expect the disciples to understand this? I think absolutely not. I, I think that he was thinking that they would hear him as speaking like, you know how adults in Charlie Brown speak? I think that's basically how they heard Jesus. Totally incomprehensible. They've already confessed. They've, they've come to this hard one conclusion. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. The pivot to suffering, rejection, crucifixion, resurrection. It was just beyond their understanding. Question three. How do we, this is pivoting to us, how do we hold to a Christology of glory and a Christology of suffering? How do we hold those in tension with each other? Because that's what we're seeing here. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And yet that, that's true of Jesus, 100% true of him. And yet at the same time, this same Jesus must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. I mean, crucified Messiah, absolute oxymoron to these people. 
And yet the absolute truth about who Jesus is and what he's about. Jesus as son of God, Jesus as God in the flesh is glorious. The son of God sent to be king, glory. And yet also the cross is never far away. He's always from birth on the trajectory toward the cross. I mean, Martin Luther is huge here. Martin Luther was, was huge on preaching, teaching, the theology of the cross, crucicentrism in face of, oh, yes, Jesus is only glorified, only awesome, only Son of God reigning. We need to hold these in tension with each other at the same time. Question four. What should we make of Jesus' use of Son of Man language here? In Matthew's telling of these stories, Jesus starts off his questioning of the disciples regarding his identity with, who do people say the Son of Man is? In Mark and Luke, we see I used instead. Mark and Luke shift to Son of Man in this following section. So why does Jesus here not say, or what does it not say here in Mark 31? He then began to teach them that he, Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Now, 100 years ago, some Bible scholars were thinking, ooh, son of man, that's a different person than Jesus. There's Jesus who speaks in terms of I, and then there's this Jesus who talks about this other character, the son of man. I just don't see how any plain reading of scripture can see Jesus and the Son of Man as separate people, as Jesus as just a sort of prophet pointing toward this other character, this Son of Man. Now, sure, it seems awkward to us to have Jesus speaking of himself in the third person as the Son of Man. But I think we just have to get over it and say, hey, yeah, that's what Jesus did. Son of Man. I don't see how we can get past the tie between Jesus referring himself to himself as son of man in Daniel's vision in chapter seven of his book. The son of man. This is one he has a vision of, one who is coming in glory. Jesus consistently talks about himself here especially in the Synoptic Gospels, although not only in the Synoptic Gospels. The Son of Man. We're going to see that over and over and over again. And here he's tying the Son of Man language to suffering, to rejection by the people. Question five. Why does Jesus use the language of necessity? The Son of Man must suffer many things. Why not just a simple future? I mean, why doesn't he just say, uh, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man will suffer many things and will be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he will be killed and after three days rise again. Why is there this, this must language, this language of necessity? It has to happen. Now, I think that it's partly that there's a future aspect here. Yeah, this is what will happen. Uh, I don't know how much we want to say that God has scripted it out, that God has this script that Jesus is saying, okay, here's my script right in front of me, and I'm doing exactly what it says. Script says, say this, do this, do that. I am saying this, doing this, and doing that. I am following the script exactly. And how much of it is just the way things were going to be, given the sinful, broken world, that Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, God incarnate, came into. I don't think there was a way around this. I don't think there was a way around Jesus taking up suffering, facing death, dying on the cross, and rising again. Question six, why is suffering integral to Jesus' identity as Son of Man? To what degree, if any, does that aspect continue as part of his identity? Uh, I think that suffering is there. That Jesus and taking upon himself our humanity. It's not just Jesus coming to the world as a superman. 
as God in the flesh with invulnerability, omnipotence, all power, all knowledge. And Jesus is kind of Superman in human disguise. He's wearing a human costume, and that's it. I think Jesus has taken the full human package here. The full human package includes suffering, includes vulnerability, includes mortality, includes death. But there's no way around that. And I think that Jesus, even now, as he reigns in glory, retains those marks, the nail prints, his hands and his feet, the spear in his side. That Jesus, even now, is suffering servant, suffering Messiah, one who died for us. That's why we see Paul, especially in 1 Corinthians, talking about preaching Christ crucified and knowing nothing but Christ crucified. Yeah, he knows Christ resurrected, absolutely. But it's the crucified Jesus who's been resurrected. But this suffering never gets beyond us. We could look, say, at Colossians 1.24. We could look at Jesus's commands that we'll get beginning to later about taking up our crosses, that we, as we become like Christ, are not just becoming like Jesus in glory, but are becoming like him in his suffering. As we fulfill complete, live into his mission, his kingdom mission of suffering with him for people. Question seven. What motivated Peter to rebuke Jesus? Under what conditions can we imagine rebuking Jesus? Well, I think this is fairly easy. I mean, Jesus, Peter has just said, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And here he is saying, okay, I'm the Messiah. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to die. No, 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 Jesus. That is not what Messiahs do. Messiahs raise their armies. Messiahs defeat their enemies. Messiahs put on crowns and sit on thrones. They don't get rejected. They don't suffer. They don't die. Come on, Jesus, you're all wrong here. Yeah, we can understand Peter challenging Jesus, rebuking Jesus. How about us? Can we imagine rebuking Jesus? Come on, Jesus, you're doing this all wrong. Come on, Jesus, uh, you're supposed to be having your way in the world now. You're supposed to be having having righteousness and justice and holiness prevailing in the world. Come on, Jesus, you're on the throne, you're ruling, you're doing it all wrong, Jesus. The wrong people are winning. And here are your people suffering, your people dying. Come on, Jesus, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, I think we can easily imagine us rebuking Jesus today because Jesus isn't doing it our way. He's not doing it the right way. Um, how, question eight, how could Peter shift so quickly from making a deep and true profession of faith regarding Jesus in verse 29 to being so wrong in verse 32? Uh, yeah, I mean, he's absolutely convinced Jesus is the Messiah. But it's his conviction and his lack of understanding of what all is included in being Messiah that allows him to pivot on a dime here, to turn on a dime and be confused about what it is to be Messiah. I think that's really easy for us too. We can be absolutely orthodox, absolutely right in who we say about Jesus, what we say about Jesus, who we believe he is. And yet the way we put that into practice, we can get him so wrong. We can be so confused, so easy for us. Question nine, what does Jesus mean when he calls Peter Satan? Is he saying that, that Peter is Satan? That, that if you took off his Peter suit, you'd find this red costume with, with horns that he's carrying a pitchfork as a forked tail? I don't think he's speaking metaphysically here. I think that Peter is here acting as the adversary. And I think Peter, as a human being, would like to avoid suffering many things. He would like to avoid being rejected by the elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law. He would like to avoid being killed, suffering on the cross. He'd like to avoid that. That'd be the easy way. I think in the voice of Peter here, in the rebuke of Peter, Jesus is hearing the same temptations he heard in the wilderness. Come on, Jesus, there's an easier way out here. Just, just openly declare yourself Messiah. Raise your army. 
I mean, you can do it. You're the son of God. You have the authority. You have the power. Just do it, Jesus. Do it the easy way. Do it the pain-free way. Peter here is speaking as an adversary to Jesus on his mission, his mission that included the cross. Question 10. Why the differentiation? Peter takes Jesus aside to rebuke him. Come on, Jesus, come over here. I've got to tell you something. Well, Jesus looks at the disciples to rebuke Peter. Because notice there, verse 33, when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, looking at all of them, then he rebukes Peter. We're seeing an indication here that when Peter was rebuking Jesus, he was serving as spokesman for the whole group, necessitating rebuke to the whole group. I mean, Peter is the one that speaks up with the confession. You are the Messiah. Maybe that's just Peter. Maybe that's the whole group consensus. But I think when Peter is rebuking Jesus, that too is a whole group consensus. They've heard Jesus saying these things. They've heard Jesus say, the son of man, I must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, that I must be killed and after three days rise again. All the disciples heard that. All the disciples were in agreement that that could not be. That, that was totally wrong. Jesus had gone off the deep end here. So that Jesus, when he's rebuking Peter, he's rebuking all of them because all of them are thinking the same thing. Question 11. What are the differences between human concerns and the concerns of God in this case? Because remember, Jesus says to Peter, you do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. Why is Jesus staying healthy and alive and in favor a human concern and not a God concern? Because we think, oh yeah, I mean, God wants Jesus to stay happy, to stay healthy, to stay successful, to have the crowds pouring in, cheering for him, giving him adulation, cheering him on as king. It sounds godly. That sounds like a God concern. Yet Jesus here frames it as a human concern. We need to go to the next question here, my last question. How can we discern between the things of God and the things of humans in our own setting? What challenges are most likely to impede us? Because it looks right here, like when Peter and ostensibly the disciples as a whole, when Peter challenges Jesus, when, G, when, they, when they rebuke Jesus, they have godly things in mind. They are being religious. They are being righteous. They are being holy. Jesus, we don't want you to suffer. We don't want you to die. We don't want you to be rejected. We, we want you to reign in glory here and now. We'd like that. We'd like that if we as Christians, we as the church, we as the people of God, were totally victorious now. There were no signs in our culture, in our country, in our world that Jesus, that God weren't getting his way in everything. And yet Jesus says here, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Unfortunately, when I look at the world, either now or recent history or throughout history. When the people of God are in charge, when they are in control, we haven't done so well. We lord it over others. We oppress others. We, we think we can force them to become Christians. I think back to the Roman Empire after Constantine, when, when uh, Roman Emperor Theodosius in 380, not only makes Christianity legal, but makes it the official religion of the Roman Empire. That sounds like victory. That sounds like Jesus being in charge, Jesus getting his way. Theodosius outlaws paganism, outlaws the worship of other gods. Sounds like victory. But do you get real Christians when you do that? Or do you just get people that say, well, I guess I have to do this. I'm not going to give my heart to Jesus, but I'll, I'll give him lip service because I got to. More often than not, I see Christians in persecution, Christians in places like China, like the Middle East, like behind the Iron Curtain. 
Christians who live in poverty. Their faith is greater because they haven't engineered their lives, so they're in control. So they, they've tried to engineer, engineer their lives in such a way they don't even need God. Hey, we got this under control, God. Well, sure, when we die, we'll go to heaven and we'll get that taken care of. Yeah, that's not a problem. But we don't need God here and now. I think God wants us to live in such a way that we need him now. That we live in radical dependence on him day in and day out. And, and what Peter was getting at here, what the disciples were trying to get at, was, was a life of security. A life where they didn't need God from day to day. Where God could be on the throne, God could be ruling. And, hey, yeah, God, you got it. We, just let us go do our own thing. I think we never get past this suffering with Jesus however much we'd like to. Well, that's what I have for today. I, I know it's not cheery. I, I know it's not maybe comforting. But maybe it is for you. Maybe if you're going through times of suffering, times of hardship, you can see that this Jesus, this suffering Messiah, the suffering servant of God, is willing to get up close and personal with you. He's willing to suffer with you and alongside you. And bring you into his suffering. His suffering that leads to, that ends in resurrection. Maybe that can be a word of hope to you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus. Jesus who came into our world as one of us. Who embraced our weakness, our brokenness, our suffering. Our rejection. That you defeated all that in his resurrection. Lord, help us to live as his people now. Taking up our crosses daily with him, for him. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, and I'll talk to you next time as we continue. And next time, finishing out maybe the book of uh, chapter eight of Book of Mark. Talk to you later. Bye.